Good afternoon. Welcome to Wednesday's Wisdom with Dave Frederick. Before we begin, we'd like to share a video from our sponsor. Nantech is widely recognized as the expert in advanced cyber. Our advanced offensive cyber capabilities are ever-changing and evolving. Mantech's partnership with the intelligence community provides a unique ability to deter foreign adversaries. Cutting-edge defensive cyber draws from our extensive experience in offensive cyber. The threat is very real, the enemy persistent, and you don't get a second chance. Please welcome INSA Executive Vice President, John Doyen. Good afternoon and thank you for joining us for Wednesday Wisdom. We're pleased to welcome today one of our community's senior leaders to the program. But before we begin, let me start with some housekeeping items. First, we hope to make this session as interactive as possible. So if you have questions, please use the Q&A box on the right-hand side of your screen to submit them. We have nearly 600 people registered for today's event, so we'll try to get to as many questions as possible. Second, we'd like to remind everyone that this uh, program is on the record, and we do have members of the press joining us today. And finally, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Mantech, for their critical support of this program. We simply cannot provide this type of thought leadership without the support of our partners. And I'd like to welcome Randy Roberge, who is Vice President, Cyber Advanced Research and Development Division for Mantech. Randy, over to you. Thank you, John. I would like to thank INSA for holding these vital conversations with our community leaders as we quickly approach the one-year mark when many of us begin full-time work from home. These programs have been critical to helping us keep our community connected. Mantech is a proud support of INSA. Mantech has supported both offensive and defensive cyber operations for over two decades. Most recently, we are working with Dave's teams and industry partners to help build out portions of the JICWA, the Joint Cyber Warfighting Architecture, supporting our national defense. JICWA is essential to the immense challenges of safeguarding our national security. Today, we are meeting this challenge in the defense environment through the Defend Forward policy, which General Nakasone rightfully calls the cornerstone of JICWA. Now it's my privilege to introduce today's speaker. Dave Frederick is the Executive Director of U.S. Cyber Command, the highest ranking of civilian and third in command at Cybercom. He leads an organization of over 12,000 personnel to include a headquarters element, six service cyber components, 133 cyber mission force teams of over 6,000 cyber war warriors, and Department of Defense Enterprise Defense Forces. Dave leads global cyber operations to defend the DoD network, provides cyber, cyber operate options for combatant commanders, and defends U.S. critical infrastructure, while shaping a budget of nearly 700 million and elements of DoD budgets totaling in the billions. Prior to his role, Dave served as Deputy Director of NSA's Cybersecurity Directorate, charged with preventing and eradicating threats to U.S. national security systems and a critical infrastructure. A U.S. Army veteran, he served as a signals intelligence analyst and Korean linguist before joining the NSA as a language analyst in 1996. Welcome, Dave. Thank you, Randy. And thank you as well, Randy, and thank you to Mantech for supporting this program. And Dave, I'd like to also extend my welcome to you. We're so glad you could uh, join us this afternoon. And to get the conversation started, I thought uh, maybe we could begin by you telling us a little bit about your role at Cyber Command and uh, the major challenges and priorities for the command. Uh, here in 2021. Great, Johnny. It's great to see you again. And I really appreciate the invitation today. It's a great chance to talk about the command and our incredible workforce. So, you know, I'll just hit three points to get it started. So one, you know, my role. So uh, as the executive director, uh, I'm an NSA officer on a joint duty assignment. And I'm part of the senior leadership team, really supporting Joe Nakasone in strategy, uh, shaping the direction we're going as a command uh, and helping advise and assist with operations. So. My particular uh, focus areas include our, our workforce strategy. Uh, uh, we're working on an academic engagement strategy, trying to uh, strengthen our, our engagement with, with universities and colleges. 
Uh, and I'm also advising on a number of our mission strategies, given my background in, in signals intelligence and cybersecurity. The uh, priorities we have at the command, you know, for this year really include uh, our, our China strategy. So supporting the commander of Indo-PACOM is, is a critical mission for us. And so we're very focused on working with Indo-Pacific Command uh, to understand what, what they need from, from Cyber Command as a supporting, supporting uh, force. We're working to mature the organization. So we have some new authorities uh, about uh, concerning budget control uh, for the cyber budget and DOD that come online in the next few years. We're working on that. And we're very focused on readiness and training of the force, uh, both military uh, and civilian. You know, Randy mentioned uh, 12,000 personnel. That's kind of include, that's inclusive of the service commands. So Army, Air Force, Navy, uh, Marines, and Coast Guard. And of that 12,000, about 6,000 form our primary fighting force. So there's, there's 133 cyber teams, about 6,000 personnel. 90% of, of those people are military and about 10% are civilian. And so we, we are looking at the workforce both from a military uh, perspective and a civilian perspective. And then finally, I'll just uh, point out two other areas we're focused on is uh, defense, defensive operations. So how do we continue to advance uh, defensive cyber operations? And then finally, something else Randy's mentioned too is the joint cyber warfighting architecture. So it's our new uh, umbrella program to try to align a number of capabilities that are being developed uh, by the by the military services for the cyber mission. Okay, well, there's a uh, a lot there, a lot going on, and a lot to talk about today. So um, maybe we'll start uh, with um, cyber operations and then get to the the JICWA piece uh, to to start off the first part of our discussion. Um, so you mentioned you have both offensive uh, and defensive cyber mission. Um, where are you at, at right now as far as the balance there? Uh, you know, uh, I recall um, uh, there was always a desire for people to be the cyber shooter. They wanted to be on the offense. Um, you know, uh, how are you with uh, the balance with the cyber defense and offense uh, workforce? Uh, well, no question in terms of workload and uh, time spent, defense dominates. And so I think in terms of workforce and mission, uh, the alignment between offense and defense is, 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 is about right. Um, the defensive mission, you know, is 24-7 mission every day, uh, major focus for us. And, um, and it's, it's evolving. I think uh, we're learning things every day, uh, really evolving the way we do intelligence support to cyber defense. That's something if, if you look back in our careers, uh, you know, earlier as intelligence officers, um, intelligence support to, you know, network defenders was not really a thing, you know, it wasn't really a focus area. And now it's really critical. And so it's, it's a major part of what we're doing. Uh, team development, offensive capability is critically important. We have to have an ability to uh, uh, impose cost on the adversary and uh, be ready to support other combatant commands like Pacific Command or European Command. So certainly we're focused on both. Uh, readiness and training for both missions is important, uh, but I would say defense in terms of just the amount of time spent is, is definitely a, a dominant topic for the command. Yeah, thinking about, you mentioned uh, uh, support to PACOM or Indo-PACOM, and, and also uh, thinking about Russia, you know, concerning some of our uh, you know, the great powers, uh, 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 out there, Russia and China. You know, what are the efforts that Cyber Command uh, is undertaking as far as trying to preemptively identify um, what our adversaries' operations and capabilities are? Okay, so it, intelligence operations and uh, and cyber reconnaissance is a key part of our mission. Uh, we we work very closely with the intelligence community. You know, I couldn't uh, you know emphasize enough the relationship, the importance of the relationships with every part of the IC uh, of special special relationship with the National Security Agency and with DIA. And DIA, in fact, is you know, the, the agency that provides us with our all source intelligence capabilities in the command. Uh, we're, we're doing assessments on those adversaries every day. I would characterize China um, as uh, the most active strategic adversary. And you know, it's definitely our number one priority in terms of understanding China's intentions. Uh, they are very active in, in targeting the United States and trying to exploit the United States, uh, focusing heavily on intellectual property theft. Uh, Russia is a very sophisticated adversary, very concerned about, about their capabilities, and, and they've got a very, uh, you know, very much a proven capability uh, to uh, conduct very sophisticated disinformation campaigns on social media platforms, and of course, very, very uh, capable uh, cyber espionage uh, capabilities as well. So, you know, clear clear uh, engagement in those cases and I, and I will I think I, now's a good time to talk about persistent engagement 
So our overarching strategy is really focused on the fact that you can't build a cyber weapon or a cyber team and put them on the shelf and wait uh, for something to happen. We really have to stay in contact every day because the adversaries are challenging the United States every day. They're trying to steal information from us every day and disrupt, disrupt the United States every day. And so our, our strategy is to stay engaged and maintain the initiative. And uh, there's two aspects of that. One aspect is enabling. So we do a lot of work to take the intelligence that we learn you know, looking out, out beyond the borders. So our focus on the intelligence mission is on the foreign side. But as we learn information about our adversaries, uh, we tip that to DHS and FBI. So we have a really uh, strong partnership with the with CISA, DHS uh, Cybersecurity Agency, and with the FBI. We tip to them so that they can then work with uh, private companies and individuals to protect them. And then on the ACT side, persistent engagement also has an ACT aspect of it. And one of the things we're doing in, in the ACT area of persistent, persistent engagement is malware disclosures. So we, we conduct operations, uh, we discover malware that the Chinese or Russians or other adversaries have developed, and then we're exposing that by sharing it with the global cybersecur uh, cybersecurity community. And the goal there is really take that tool out of their toolbox and improve uh, you know, cybersecurity across the, across the globe. Great. Um, I wanted to go back to something you said uh, and um, tie it in to a uh, really uh, top uh, topic right now, uh, and that is solar wind. So we were talking about the Chinese, of course, as a big strategic uh, uh, concern. Uh, and then you also mentioned Russia. Uh, and that made me think about a little bit about solar winds. And I was wondering, um, uh, you know, you know, solar winds, the, you know, some people call it the cyber Pearl Harbor. It was a very significant uh, uh, event. Um, uh, what are your views on that? And also, what's what exactly is the cyber command role uh, in an event like Solar Winds? Um, given that there was a foreign adversary has been assessed to be behind the attack. Uh, great questions. Very, very uh, time relevant right now. So let me start off with the first part, and then I'll go back to the Pearl Harbor analogy. Um, so on the first, the, I mean the second part. The, the second part of the question is what's our role? So. Uh, the National Security Council has established a, uh, a what's called a unified coordination group. And so in the, in the executive branch policy, yeah, it's basically a cyber uh, crisis management mechanism. <clears throat> and the, the lead agencies for that and working with the NSC is DHS, FBI, and the Office of Director of National Intelligence. And so CyberCon is heavily engaged supporting those, uh, those uh, agencies and departments in a supporting role. So we have a supporting role. Uh, we're working on options uh, for the NSC to present options for the president con to consider. And of course, we're, we're very focused on defending DOD networks. It's one of our, you know, it's one of our three main missions. Uh, the, uh, the DOD network uh, review, as you can imagine, DOD is a huge organization. We have a lot of networks. Um, so we've put a lot of energy into looking at the solar winds uh, applications that we had on our networks and to make sure uh, we were safe and secure uh, to date. There's no evidence of DOD compromises, you know, compromise of the DOD network uh, because of solar winds. That doesn't mean we weren't exposed. Okay, so we have solar winds products, but it it indicates that you know to date, and I, we're still looking, so we never stop looking. But to date, we've seen no evidence of compromise. Meaning our broader defense in depth, the layers of defense that we've got in place prevented the adversary from advancing, you know, and, and taking advantage of the of the toehold they had. Um, you know, the, the NSC is still working on, on options, and, and, and so I won't, I won't kind of go into more details on, on what, what the administration would do, uh, you know, as, as they look at policy options, but it's, I would just highlight one thing, and that's the, the public-private partnership is really key. So, you know, by design, um, no government agency has full visibility in the cyber threats that affect our, our nation. And um, you know it's really important for companies to come forward when they when they realize they've been breached or they have a they think their products have been compromised and share that information with the government uh, and with the cybersecurity industry so that we you know collectively can take action. And so you know really really hats off to to uh, to the company you know FireEye who came forward and reported it early on and uh, it just going to highlight that any of these major threats it's going to take a public uh, private team to uh, to protect the nation. So on the Pearl Harbor, real quick, I, I find that an interesting analogy. Um, I, I would not, I would not uh, in any way uh, relate solar winds to to a to a cyber Pearl Harbor um, because 
and the reason for that is very serious, very serious incident, very, very damaging. But it, it didn't result in loss of life. If you look at Pearl Harbor, the tremendous loss of life and the destruction of military capability, neither one of those things happened. But I do think it also is an interesting example of how much things have changed. And, and I'm gonna go back to the public-private partnership angle. So Pearl Harbor, uh, you know, military leaders on Oahu were unable to uh, put the pieces of the puzzle together and, and take action because information was extremely slow. Um, all the information, you know, the, the indications and warning information that could have helped the Oahu military uh, leadership take action was all government generated, right? So it's diplomatic reporting, it was code breaking uh, by the predecessors uh, of the NSA, and it was a radar operator that mis misidentified uh, the incoming uh, uh, aircraft as, as friendly US uh, bombers flying in. If you look at solar winds, um, first of all, the speed of information and the volume of information we're dealing with is just stunning you know, every day. Mm -hmm. uh, and most of that information is not government information. Most of that information is in the hands of the private sector. Um, putting the pieces of the puzzle together, that's a shared problem. It's, it's, it's not, it's very similar in that context. But I think today it's a problem of volume of information. And then how do we bring together different sources of information, really understand a threat, an advanced threat like we saw with solar winds? Mm -hmm. One, one other thing on solar winds. So you've talked, you've stressed a lot, uh, Dave, the uh, public-private partnership aspect. Um, uh, are there any other lessons learned uh, from the solar wind hack uh, that you could could share? I, I think um, it's a little early on that. The only the only thing I would say right now is to when you step back and look at what enterprise organizations were able to contain the risk. And so I think there will be some lessons learned about enterprise network defense. Um, so if you look at, you know, kind of zero trust concepts, it's kind of one of the current, you know, uh, security concepts that people are really looking at. <clears throat> how, do, how do you have layered defenses to prevent a supply chain threat like this? And so mm -hmm. I, I think there'll be some lessons learned there. You know, I, the early, beyond that, I think it's still too early to tell. Okay. I do want to ask you a couple of questions about JIPWA next, but before I do that, I'd just like to remind everyone um, we are taking your questions. If you have any questions, please use the tool on the right and we'll get to those um, shortly. Uh, but before that, let me say, go back to JIKWA and some of the questions we have been getting have been regarding JIKWA. Um, and uh, one from, uh, we'll take one from uh, Jared Gazarek, who asked, what uh, are Cybercom's plans regarding the JIKWA architecture and specifically uh, the unified platform since the report came out uh, in the fall from GAO, uh, uh, stressing some of the needs uh, that needed to be addressed regarding the way ahead for JICWA. Okay, uh, great question. And I let me let me start with uh, an explanation of what is JICWA, just to level level knowledge. So the Joint Cyber Warfighting Architecture is the overarching program or architecture we have in place to align multiple development programs that are underway. And so a little bit wonky in terms of the acquisition aspect of it, but there are six major programs or, or major um, components, I should say, of JICWA. Unified platform is our big data platform. So it's really our data analysis, data science platform. It's where we'll bring in, for example, lots of network data uh, from the DoD networks. Um, we have an access component, which you know is about our offensive and defensive operational activities. You know where we're getting connecting out of our network, sensors, tools, a command and control capability, joint command and control, and then finally a cyber training environment, uh, which allows our our teams. So it's team level training. You know you can get a bunch of operators and analysts together, and they can actually practice in a simulated environment, you know, conducting an offensive or defensive operation. So JIPWA, all, all those capabilities I mentioned are developed um, and being managed by the military services, uh, primarily Air Force and Army, but every one of the services has has a piece a piece to play there in some way, shape or form. Um, JIPWA, we have a small office at the cyber command level, at the headquarters level, that's doing the integration. So they're, they're looking at these components that have been, um, that were all in existence pretty much before JICWA, right? So we're trying to now weave this together. Um, and, and we're, you know, it's, it's very much a new effort. Uh, we have a lot of work to do. Um, great team in place, uh, re really brilliant team in place working on this. And, and, I'll, and I'll highlight great partnership with the different program offices. So uh, no concerns there. 
think the tricky part you know, for anybody who's done you know large scale acquisition you know uh, programs is how do you synchronize? So how do we get all these programs to have a shared vision and a shared set of priorities to work through the interconnections and the interdependencies? And so that's our big challenge right now. Um, we also are working with relatively limited authority at the command level, right? Most of the decision making authority is at the at the acquisition program level within the military services. And so pulling that off, you know, is tricky, uh, but I, we have a really good, like I said, a really good team in place that's working uh, every day, uh, every day with the programs. Um, the GAO report was mentioned, highlighted some of the problems. That's what we're focused on fixing. Uh, there's also a, um, a congressional task to uh, for the Defense Science Board. So the Defense Science Board will be looking at uh, the JICWA program in, in the upcoming year. Okay, great. Um, well, thank you for that. And uh, any status update on where you are with the governance structure uh, being being set to help you uh, shape this going forward? Uh, for JICWA particularly? Right. Yeah, so we, we already have an, a JICWA uh, office. So we have a, 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 a colonel uh, running a team. So we have really two teams, um, a uh, overarching management office that works for the deputy commander. So he works, uh, the, uh, the colonel works for Lieutenant General Moore, the deputy commander. Mm -hmm. And we also have a another team that's doing all the requirements analysis. So, you know, great, great team effort, constant updates. Uh, you know, it's a got a rotational update to Jerome Akasoni uh, on the various parts of the program. And uh, we're, we're using a lot of these capabilities every day right now. So it's not, this isn't a bunch of activity that's gonna someday deliver something in four or five years. Um, all the programs pretty much are on a, kind of a rapid uh, acquisition model. So we're getting incremental capabilities all the time. Um, and one, one area that we're using all the time right now is, is the command and control tool. So how can we monitor the readiness of our cyber mission teams in terms of mm -hmm training and, and team team capability to execute their missions. Okay, um, and let's go to a couple of questions here. We've been getting a lot uh, in regarding um, an area that you said you're responsible for, Dave, which is sort of the training and skills aspect of the cyber workforce. Uh, and um, uh, one of the sort of what, maybe this is a, a good one for the top uh, of this discussion. What's your biggest challenge regarding talent for US Cyber Command? It's it's a it's a two part challenge and it's recruiting and retention. <laughs> now, I know that's not going to be surprising for anybody, but when you look at the the need across the, the United States for cybersecurity and computer science experts, so for STEM STEM in general, um, you know I saw one estimate that for cybersecurity alone in the private sector, there's 400,000 empty you know vacant positions. So the need is great. We're in fierce competition. Uh, with our industry colleagues uh, in, that support us, and also with uh, the broader cybersecurity community for talent. And so bringing people in, getting people in the door quickly on the civilian side and the military side, uh, training them, and then retaining them once they have you know, these specialized skills is, is definitely a challenge. Uh, I'll say across the board, uh, the military services and the Department of Defense are making really good progress on presenting the compensation options we have, you know, within ex within the extent the government can do it, compensation options to incentivize people to come on board um, and and stay. So on the on the civilian side, uh, there, we we've established what's called the cyber accepted service. So mm -hmm. it's very similar to how the intelligence community has um, different personnel authorities than the than the core civil service, and uh, ten of the eleven uh, components in the Department of Defense that will that will you know be under cyber executive services already started started the program what that does is gives us more flexibility to hire civilians we can offer um recruiting incentives so we can offer you know uh, incentive bonuses to bring people on board we can pay for relocation we can we can move them faster we're still way too slow in terms of hiring that's not something i'd really like to improve on but it's something that's something that we definitely need to work on and then on the military side you know all the services have made really good progress in structuring their skill community their skill fields or you know their work roles uh, for the both the commission officers and the enlisted and uh, are working on different compensation incentives right so we want to we want to bring folks in and keep them on the team uh you know uh, for, for quite some time and, and each service is working on retention bonuses and, and the like to try to try to get that at the right level okay Hey, I wanted to ask you a question. A lot of people have you know, talked about uh, the cyber mission and cyber as a team sport. 
And um, so I wanted to ask you a little bit about the relationship between Cyber Command and probably your closest teammate, uh, NSA. And in particular, uh, maybe a good way to ask it is from one of the questioners we've just got, got uh, here from one of our listeners who ask, what is the distinction between what NSA does in cyber defense versus what Cyber Command does in cyber defense? And that's from uh, uh, James Clapper. Ah, great. Uh, it's a great question, and it's what a what a uh, what an honor to get a question from uh, from Director Clapper. If it's the same James Clapper, I think it is. So uh, that's that's exciting. So yeah, that's that's a great question, and l let me lay it out. So NSA has um, two strategically focused missions for cybersecurity, and the first mission is producing the codes, the encryption capabilities to protect our nation's most secret networks. And so we have a, just an incredibly capable um, group of engineers and mathematicians at NSA that develop uh, the, the, the codes, develop the encryption keys, develop the devices, and work with industry that, that actually manufactures the devices. We produce all the codes and keys at NSA that protects the communications from the president all the way down to the ICV on this. So all the entire nuclear command control structures protected. So that's job one. Job two, in terms of network security, is we're focused on classified networks. So NSA has, uh, the director of NSA has responsibilities to protect national security systems is the, is, the, is the terminology used. So any classified network operated by the, you know, the Treasury Department, uh, by the NSA, by FBI, you name it, the DOD, we set standards uh, to, to protect those networks. So that's the NSA rule. On the Cyber Command side, Job one is defending the DOD network. So uh, the DOD has got just a massive network, you know, series of networks across the department. And so Cybercom is drives working with DISA and you know, through our Joint Force headquarters. Um, we we do the network protection uh, to ensure that all those networks are secure, available, you know, capable of executing mission operations. It's it's quite a job. It's just a, a real daunting job. Um, and uh, and that's that's the big distinction. We we there's expertise on both sides, uh, and as well with a number of this uh, service components, and with this, uh, you know, great great depth of expertise across the DoD team on cybersecurity. But we do have distinct but complementary missions. Great. Well, thanks for that. And another team uh, team effort uh, or team sport uh, type of thing that uh, I believe Cyber Command was engaged with was some of our election security. For the past number of years and especially last last year with the 2020 elections um so we've learned a lot about election interference and security since well at least 2016. um and so what's cyber command's role uh as as a player in the interagency there and what efforts has cyber command been able to take regarding election integrity great uh great question so you know first i'll note that that the cyber command's role we were part of a whole of government effort to protect the, the elections and um you know we work very closely with dhs and fbi uh odni and of course nsa uh, for nsa um for both the 2018 midterm election and the 2020 election you're not only formed small joint groups and uh between cyber command and nsa and and had very senior you know leaders in both organizations able to orchestrate and coordinate the work we were doing to support to support DHS and FBI. The, um, the one analogy, like a sports analogy would be, if you think about a home game or an away game, mm -hmm. DHS and FBI has the home game, okay? And so DHS had the lead to work with state and local election officials to ensure that election systems, so the election infrastructure itself was secure. So there was a lot of work, and you know, frankly, a lot of this work started in 2016, but really ramped up in front of the 2018 election, and then then continued forward into 2020. FBI was also working with companies and individuals uh, when cyber actors tried to compromise, you know, a, a state or or a company or an individual. So so FBI and DHS had the home game, Cybercom was on the away game. So we're focused on foreign threats outside of our borders. And the, the joint team between NSA and, and Cybercom, you know, our big contribution, uh, I would say, was really in enabling DHS and FBI. So it kind of goes back to our persistent engagement strategy. We, we, we were focused on the adversaries 
Uh, I will tell you in 2018, the main focus was Russia, unquestionably. In 2020, we stayed very focused on Russia, but we also had to deal with uh, threats from Iran and China. And so it became a, a broader problem. Um, you know, I mentioned DHS's role on the election infrastructure. The other major threat is influence operations, right? So adversaries trying to inject dis disinformation uh, in, into, the, into the conversation on social media to really affect, uh, affect people's trust in the election. Uh, and and that, that was the part you know, where we worked very closely in tipping to the FBI. Um, we, we, we saw in terms of threat, uh, a threat change we saw in, in 2020 was what we call perception hacking. So I Iran, we saw this from, from Iran in particular, where they would take an inconsequential um, cyber incident, right? Some, get some information off the internet about some inconsequential event and then connect it visually with information about um, about you know false information that's that's uh, that, that basically would leave an impression that a voting system had been hacked something like that. Another example of what Iran tried to do you know if you look at the the announcement by the FBI uh, where they they had sent out um, uh, emails to people trying to act, act in an intimidating way to try to to try to influence the election. So that those are kind of some of the changes we saw in 2020 compared to 2018. Um, in terms of enabling FBI and DHS, we tipped over a thousand technical indicators of compromise and 200 actual, you know, compromises where a malicious cyber actor, a foreign actor, was trying to compromise somebody's, you know, email or or network um, mm -hmm. for some, some reason. We also uh, exposed malware. So in the act category, in terms of what did we do directly, um, as we found foreign adversary malware. We actually exposed it out, uh, you know, shared it with the cybersecurity community so that people could take defensive measures. Right. Hey, continuing along the, the theme of uh, sort of cyber as a team sport, um, one thing of, uh, that uh, makes us all effective is information sharing. So we have a question re uh, that came in from Peter Watts, who asked, what plans are there to enhance direct cooperation and knowledge sharing between industry and cyber command? Okay, um, I, I think I would highlight two areas. So one is back on cyber defense. And I think the important, the important point there will be, how, how do we just continue to advance sharing of, of indicators back and forth? Um, that's another area where we partner closely with NSA, who's established a cybersecurity coll uh, collaboration center recently uh, as part of the new directorate. Um, so how do we move really from transactional information sharing to more collaboration. That's that's what we're looking for. How do we how do we how do we work on joint problems? Uh, for example, an acquisition program. You know, if there's a weapons program that's being developed and industry's got a role in it, how how can we work between the government and that industry partner to protect? Um, the other part is you know getting after some of the capabilities challenges. And so uh, we do have uh, Dreamport is a is a partnership we have with uh, with uh, the Maryland with the Maryland Innovation Institute. Um, it, and I'd recommend, recommend people go to look at their, our Dreamport um, website. You can just search on it on the internet, search for Dreamport, you'll find that. But that's another uh, venue we use to try to share information more about technology development, challenges and ideas. Thanks. Um, along those lines, another industry uh, related question is in from Richard Lurie, who's with Northrop Grumman. And he asked, where can industry be most effective Supporting Cyber Command's highest priorities and toughest technical and mission challenges. Okay, um, that's a great question. So I, I think I'll, I'll highlight a few initiatives and, and a few ways to, to get information about our needs. Um, one is going back to the role we have with JICWA and uh, the roles of the services. So I do think uh, to I would encourage industry to not only uh, keep an eye out on um, you know, Cybercom information on Dreamport and on some of the acquisition websites, uh, but to also, you know, stay engaged with the uh, Army Cyber, Air Force Cyber, et cetera, because they, they have they have programs in a way as well. Um, in terms of the needs at the command level and our priorities, we, we use the Dreamport uh, venue uh, to share information. So we publish challenge problems 
And uh, you can go, if you go to the Dreamport website to the opportunities section and pull down, you can find a full list of our current challenge problems. And then we highlight certain ones that we're focused on right now. Uh, we have three listed right now that we're focused on, uh, vulnerability research, uh, kind of tool survivability, and uh, global situational awareness of malware. So how could we track, for example, North Korean malware uh, at, a global, at a global scale? Uh, so those are good resources. And our, our command acquisition executive, you know, uh, some of the engagement, frankly, took a hit with COVID, right? It's really hard to get everybody together. Um, but we're we're starting up quarterly roundtables. So our command acquisition executive is going to be starting up quarterly roundtables uh, with industry uh, to talk about uh, some of our needs. And uh, we're looking at a virtual industry day later in the year, uh, since it's, you know, still not really practical to do a, any kind of a, a classic physical industry day. Hey, we do have a question in as well from an editor with FCW, uh, Lauren Williams, and she asked, how is Cyber Command handling the Microsoft Exchange attack and taking steps to prevent or better protect against similar campaigns? It's a great question. Um, so it's still pretty early that, you know, that, that attack. So uh, at the command level, job one is defend. And uh, we've, we've been working on uh, defensive measures. So we've, you know, we've looked at all of our uh, exchange servers across the DOD to look and make sure that any of them that, is, that are internet facing is, is getting patched quickly. So we've taken those steps. And then we're working, um, as we do with any major cyber incident, we started the, the work with uh, DHS, FBI, uh, really under the, and ODNI, really under the National Security Council's leadership. So we're plugging into that process uh, as, the, as the, whole, the whole team kind of steps back and looks at, at the next steps. Um, there's quite a bit of good public reporting uh, uh, from various bloggers uh, and, and such on the Microsoft Exchange vulnerability. Uh, very concerning uh, from what I've seen in, on the open source reporting about uh, just the, the, the indiscriminate broad use of that exploit by the adversary. So it's definitely gotta be a concern. Great. Hey, you know, we have lots of uh, students who tune into these programs uh, routinely. And uh, we do have a question from a student who attends Syracuse, uh, Justin Mitchell. He asked, for students who want to join the intelligence community, what would you tell them they need to prepare for the most? Great question. Well, let me let me first just emphasize, you know, I, I, I it's been a, a, a real honor to serve in the intelligence community, but first as a as a soldier uh, and and as a as a civilian uh, for over you know over 31 years now, and um, so I, I encourage uh, students to join up. Um, you know, the the IC needs all kinds of people. Uh, and we need we need folks from all different walks of life and different backgrounds and in every practically every major. So I wouldn't steer you in one direction or another. Obviously, Cyber Command is very focused on STEM, computer science, uh, math, engineering. But we also need language analysts. We need intelligence analysts with liberal arts backgrounds. Uh, we need business personnel. Um, one thing one thing to do is be patient. Keep your nose clean <laughs> and be patient. And and the be patient part is. Uh, there's been improvements in security, um, the security processing, but it's still a it's still a long process. It takes way too long. So I, I encourage students to start early, uh, and then and then be be patient. The other the, the other point I would I would make is just look broadly. There's a lot of opportunities out there um, across the the big the, the big IC agencies, but also with each military service. I think people don't um, always realize that uh, all the military um, has um, you know civilian positions as well. Available that are that are that are you know that can work can can serve a role, uh, especially on the cyber side. We're, there's a lot of hiring going on right now in cyber, um, and also the industry teams. So it's you know there's a lot of opportunities there. It's great to hear a question like that. Uh, wish that person the best. Hey, we've got time for maybe one or two more questions, and I'll I'll ask this next one and also make a shameless plug for uh, INSA's open source symposium that's going to be in in uh, April. So keep tuned for that. Uh, and this question asked, uh, it's from uh, Abel Vandergrift, who's works with Authenticate. Uh, how would you describe the role of open source intelligence in Cyber Command's mission sets? It's critical. I mean, I especially when you look at the defensive mission, um, there's so much information, there's so much cyber threat intelligence information available now on the on the, on the commercial side. So it's it's critical. And uh, it's it's an area that you know I, I think uh, it won't only be important for cyber command. I think it's of growing importance for the entire intelligence community. Is how do we tap into all that information? It's just there's so much knowledge out there, uh, so much available to really um, help 
let, you know, uh, complement what we can learn through more secret means. So uh, couldn't, couldn't emphasize enough the importance of it. We use it every day um, and, uh, you know, don't see that changing anytime soon besides growing in terms of importance. Great. And um, I think we have time for one last question. Um, and I'll go back to the cyber, the cyber um, team question. And just can you talk a little bit about how Cyber Command is working with our allies, uh, Five Eyes partners and others to help better defend uh, against threats from common adversaries? Uh, okay, yes. So we, yeah, we do work closely with, with a number of allies. Um, a, little, a little bit in terms of describing how the military organizes partnerships. The geographic combatant commands, so for example, Indo-Pacific Command or European Command or Central Command, they have a, a, the lead on what's called theater security cooperation. <clears throat> and so we work in support with them. And so we'll, we work, for example, with, with uh, Indo-PACOM on partnerships with some of our Asia Pacific allies. Uh, we have a very close relationship with the, with the Five Eyes community, as one would expect, and that's done in, you know, you know, in teamwork with our, with our intelligence community colleagues because uh, of the kind of intertwined nature of missions at, at the various um, the partner agencies. And, uh, and we share tools uh, and, and or share training with the Five Eyes, not tools, but we share training with the Five Eyes. We also have a number of bilateral exercises. And so uh, just as a couple of examples, we have a bilateral exercise uh, with France. Uh, we have one with Japan and, and a number of other uh, close allies. Great. Well, Dave, I think we're about out of time, but there's a few minutes left. So I just wanted to turn the, the, the floor over to you and say, do you have any closing thoughts for us this afternoon? Well, again, I just want to thank everybody uh, for the work they're doing. You know, this can, this group is mostly uh, focused, you know, mostly of people that are focused on the national you know, national security and, and protecting this nation. And I just want to thank all of you for your contributions. Uh, really appreciate the invitation. Uh, I'm I'm very, you know, cybersecurity can can be a little a little bit uh, depressing at times because it's, you know, defense defense is really hard. Uh, but I'm also very optimistic, and uh, you know, I think if, if we can harness the the you know the uh, the ingenuity of, of, of the American tech industry and, and government and really work through some of these policy challenges. I, I'm, I'm actually optimistic that we can, we can you know, raise the bar uh, permanently on defense over the next few years. So again, thanks so much for, for the invitation. Well, Dave, thank you. It's been so uh, such a pleasure and honor to host you this afternoon. And thank you for your candid insights and um, hope to talk to you again soon. Thanks, John. For everyone here that's uh, joined us today, watching online, thank you for joining. And once again, thank you to Mantech uh, for sponsoring this program. Uh, I would like to make a couple notes uh, looking ahead to some other upcoming activities. Uh, uh, in March, we have two more uh, speaker events coming. We'll have Rear Admiral Andrew Sujimoto next week on Tuesday morning. He'll join us for coffee and conversation talking about intelligence and the Coast Guard. And we'll close out our March programming with the Chief Operating Officer for ODNI, Laura Shaw. Laura Shaw will be joining us uh, Wednesday afternoon, the 24th of March. Um, looking into April, as I, I mentioned, we do have a spring symposium, that, and the topic of that will be open source intelligence, uh, thinking outside the SCIF. We've got a great uh, program for two, to, two afternoons planned with keynotes and with um, some panel discussions, so uh, stay tuned for that. Also, we will have in April, we'll have a supply chain event called Securing Microelectronics. And that'll be focusing on um, the issue of a microelectronic shortage. And we'll be doing that in partnership with the Semiconductor Industry Association. Also, um, wanted to mention that uh, we'll be having an event in June, the National Security Showcase, the 8A National Security Showcase, and this will be our inaugural um, uh, event uh, of this type. And um, we are really looking forward to this. It'll be in two days on the 8th and 9th of June. And this virtual event, it'll provide an opportunity for 8A businesses to market their innovative national security technologies, applications, and services uh, to procurement representatives from both government and private sector. Um, to participate, you need to fill out an application and apply and the application deadline is Wednesday, 31st of March, so uh, at the end of this month. As always, you can find out about all of these activities and more on our website, www.insaonline.org, where you can get all the details, registration, uh, connections, and so forth. 
When this webinar ends, there will be a short survey that pops up. Please take a few moments to fill it out. We read each of them and we value the comments that we get and it helps us to uh, uh, you know, produce these programs better and get the guests uh, that you would like us to, to have. This concludes today's program. Stay safe and enjoy this beautiful afternoon. Thank you.